ever feel like the army just throws dictionary at you and calls it doctrine? Well, today we're tackling one of those ADP 305. But don't worry, we're going to cut through the jargon to make this deep dive on army special ops both clear and hopefully useful for you. Definitely. And it's crucial to really grasp how these forces are structured, how they operate, especially for someone in your shoes. Absolutely. And we're zeroing in on Chapter 3 today, Command and Control. The behind-the-scenes playbook. Yeah, exactly. How do these special ops missions actually function within that bigger military machine? And one thing Chapter 3 really stresses is that it takes a whole orchestra, you know, for these missions to really succeed. Oh, for sure. And we're not just talking about different units within the Army, but we're talking about the government agencies, NGOs, international partners. Okay, so a whole lot of cooks in the kitchen. How do you even begin to wrangle that many different groups? I mean, often with different priorities, too. Right, and that's where, well, perhaps an unexpected player comes in the ambassador. Wait, the ambassador? I wouldn't have thought they would be so involved in the, you know, the nitty-gritty of military operations. Yeah, and it's easy to forget, but the ambassador is the president's representative in that country. That's right. They're responsible for all U.S. government activities there, right. including military personnel who aren't directly under a combatant commander. So even though special ops have their own chain of command, the ambassador still holds significant sway. Absolutely. What happens if there's a difference of opinion, say, on the best course of action? Well, that's where those strong relationships and those clear communication channels that the doctrine emphasizes become absolutely vital. Yeah, bad. Let's say, for example, a hostage rescue situation. The military might be ready to execute a tactical operation, while the ambassador might be pursuing a diplomatic solution. Right. Both have valid points. Exactly. And miscommunication in that situation could be disastrous. For sure. Unity of effort is something that the doctrine keeps hammering on. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> everyone working in sync, even if they're from different worlds. Exactly. And building that trust, that shared understanding, especially with the ambassador and their team, it's really paramount, especially when you're talking about, you know, those delicate stability operations or those long-term security cooperation efforts. It makes you realize it's not just about being, you know, combat ready, but also diplomacy savvy. Absolutely. But how does this unity of effort actually translate on the grounds you know where do special ops fit into the larger military structure once they're deployed overseas well adp 305 lays out what it calls theater of operations organizations specifically highlighting the theater army and then the theater special operations command or tsoc for short okay so let's break those down a little bit first up the theater army what's their role in all of this so think of the theater army as the long-term um, representative of the U.S. Army for that specific region. They handle everything from deterrence to security cooperation, acting as that main point of contact for the geographic combatant commander. They can even act as a joint task force headquarters if needed. So they're the established presence. Exactly. The ones who are you know, already building relationships, maintaining stability. Where do you special ops forces fall under them. And here's where it gets really interesting. While Army Special Ops, they report directly to the TSOC, the Theater Army specifically, the Theater Sustainment Command, they play a critical logistical role. Okay. They're the ones ensuring those special ops units have the supplies, the maintenance, transportation, basically everything they need to function. So even though there's a separate command structure for special ops, they still rely heavily on the theater army for support. Hugely. And this is where a very specific unit comes in, the 528th Sustainment Brigade Special Operations Airborne. They're the specialist in supporting special ops, no matter how complex or remote the mission might be. They're like the logistical wizards, making sure those elite soldiers have what they need, even in the toughest spots. So we're already seeing this, you know, intricate web of support and collaboration, yeah. even within the Army itself. But let's dive a little deeper into that TSOC you mentioned. What makes it so special? So the TSOC, it's like the regional hub, you know, for special ops. Yeah. Like if you're operating in, say, the Pacific, you'd fall under Special Operations Command Pacific, right. which is part of the larger U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. So each geographic combatant commander has their own Special Ops Command working directly under them. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. But the doctrine says the TSOC commander has three primary roles. Right. That's, that's a lot to juggle. It is a testament to the complex nature of these operations. Yeah. So on one hand, they're a joint force commander leading units from different branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, you name it. 
Right. They're also the go-to advisor for the combatant commander on all things special ops. Okay. Providing expert guidance on how these unique capabilities can best support the overall strategy. So they're not just giving orders. Right. They're actually offering specialized advice at the highest levels. Exactly. And if a joint task force is formed, say for a large-scale crisis response, the TSOC commander can even step into the role of joint force special operations component commander, yeah. leading the special ops elements within that larger task force. It's like they're a special ops Swiss army knife. That's a great way to put it. Ready for anything. And this brings us to a crucial part of Chapter 3. Okay. Understanding the different layers of command within special operations. It's like that organizational chart everyone glances at during onboarding. Right. But then it becomes essential knowledge down the line. Exactly. And at the very top of the special ops org chart, you've got the special operations joint task force, mm -hmm. the SOJTF. Okay, SOJTF. That one sounds familiar. Oh. Refresh my memory. What makes them stand out? What's fascinating about the SOJTF is its adaptability. Okay. The doctrine emphasizes its modularity, scalability, tailorability. It can be adjusted to fit the mission at hand. Need a small, nimble force for a quick strike. SOJTF can do that. Got it. Need to coordinate a large-scale multinational operation. SOJTF can handle that, too. So they're the big guns. Often, yes. Yes, called in for those high-stakes scenarios. They're designed to provide direct support to geographic combatant commanders. Okay. Particularly in complex situations involving multiple nations or a significant threat. Makes sense. So if SOJTF is the big leagues, yeah. what about the next level down? That would be the Joint Special Operations Task Force, the JSOTF. Okay. Think of them as the SOJTF's more agile cousin. Okay. Still multi-service. Okay. But smaller, faster to deploy, and designed for a different tempo of operation. Okay, so maybe not full-blown war fighting. Right. But situations where speed and precision are key. Exactly. Crisis response, counterterrorism, limited contingency operations. The JSOTF is structured to react quickly and effectively often operating directly under SOJTF or even a TSOC. They sound like the first responders of the special ops world. In a way. And then we have the Special Operations Task Force, the SOTF. Yeah. What's their area of expertise? The SOTF is where we get down to the tactical level, the sharp end of the spear. Okay. Typically formed around a single special operations battalion. Got it. They're the ones executing the missions planned at those higher echelons, SOJTF. JSOTF, et cetera. So they're the ones putting boots on the ground. Yes. Directly engaging with the situation at hand. You got it. They need to be versatile, adaptable, and able to work effectively in a wide range of environments and scenarios. Right. And to support them in those often austere conditions, the doctrine also highlights the Advanced Operations Base, or AOB. AOB, that one sounds kind of familiar. Yeah. Paint me a picture. Okay. What's an AOB actually look like? Picture this. You're deep in hostile territory miles from any established base. Okay. You need a secure location to operate from to train local forces, maybe pre-stage equipment. That's where an ARB comes in. It's a temporary, often austere base set up close to the action to provide that vital support to deployed special operations forces. So not quite a five-star hotel. No. But essential for extending their operational reach. Exactly. And just like everything else in special ops, flexibility is key. Yeah. These AOBs might be manned by a special forces company. Um, they're designed to be set up and dismantled quickly, and they might lack some of the comforts of home. Right. But they are absolutely vital for the success of those forward deployed units. It sounds like ADP 305s has really thought of everything when it comes to structuring these task forces for maximum impact. Absolutely. But they don't operate in a vacuum, do they? What about support from other branches, especially in those fast-moving joint operations scenarios? You're hitting on a crucial point. Yeah. Special Ops is rarely a solely Army affair. Right. And ADP 305 acknowledges this highlighting key support structures, like the Joint Special Operations Air Component Commander. Ah, uh, Air Support can't have those daring raids without it. You got it. So who provides this specialized air power? The Air Force Special Operations Command plays a major role often supplying the commander and core staff for this crucial component. Right. And of course, this is where we often see those legendary Night Stalkers in action. You're talking about the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, right? Yes. Those guys are practically celebrities in the special ops world. And for good reason, their expertise in providing pinpoint accurate air support, often in extremely challenging conditions, is a huge force multiplier for special operations forces on the ground. Wow. 
but they're not the only ones. Oh. The doctrine also highlights the role of the special operations liaison element. Okay. Their job is to ensure everyone is on the same page, that air surface and subsurface operations are all coordinated and deconflicted. So no friendly fire incidents. Exactly. That level of coordination seems absolutely critical, especially with so many moving parts. Absolutely. And to further streamline that coordination, you have the special operations command and control element. They act as the critical link between special operations forces and conventional forces, ensuring everyone is on the same page, avoiding conflicts, and maintaining that crucial unity of effort we talked about earlier. They're like the diplomatic core of the battlefield. That's a great way to put it. Making sure everyone is speaking the same language, operationally speaking, of course. And you'll often find them embedded at higher command levels, a core, for instance, to ensure that seamless integration between special ops and conventional forces. We've got the theater level the task forces, the vital support elements. Right. It's a complex web. It is. But it seems like the doctrine does a good job of breaking it down. Yeah. But what about the really big picture? Where does USIC fit into all of this? Ah, USS. There are the head honchos, the ones responsible for ensuring all those Army Special Operations units we've been talking about are trained, equipped, and ready to deploy at a moment's notice. So they're calling the shots for the entire Army Special Ops community. In a way, yes. Okay. Think of them as the architects of Army Special Operations. They develop doctrine, establish training standards, manage resources, and even handle some of the budgeting. Wow. They're one of the nine combatant commands, which gives you an idea of just how much responsibility rests on their shoulders. That's a heavy lift. And under their umbrella, you've got those iconic units. Yes. First Special Forces Command, Airborne, the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center, and School Army Special Operations Aviation Command, and of course the 75th Ranger Regiment, Airborne. You've named some of the most elite units in the world. They are. Each with their own unique capabilities and areas of expertise, all playing a crucial role in the larger special operations landscape. Let's break those down a bit, starting with 1st Special Forces Command, the Green Berets. The Green Berets are masters of unconventional warfare, often working behind enemy lines to train and advise partner forces. They're known for building those crucial relationships and empowering local forces. Precisely, and they don't do it alone. The 1st Special Forces Command also includes units like the 95th Civil Affairs Brigade, the 4th and 8th Psychological Operations Groups, and bringing things full circle. The 528th Sustainment Brigade, which we talked about earlier. Right, yeah. All these units work together, each contributing their expertise to ensure the success of those complex special operations missions. It really highlights that team-oriented approach. It does. It's not just about combat skills. It's about understanding the human terrain, building trust, and working together towards a common goal. What about the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center in school? Right. They sound more academic than tactical. They are, in a way. Okay. Think of them as the intellectual powerhouse behind special operations. Okay. They're responsible for developing the doctrine, training, and education for those specialized units we've been discussing. So they make sure everyone is speaking the same language and operating from the same playbook. You could say that they're also the proponents for those crucial branches like civil affairs, psychological operations, and special forces making sure these fields have the right people, the right training, and the right doctrine to support the Army's mission. And what about the Army Special Operations Aviation Command? Right. Helicopters are a vital part of special ops. They are. Especially for those rapid deployments and extractions. Absolutely, and this command ensures those specialized air assets are ready to go at a moment's notice. Yeah. Think infiltration, resupply, exfiltration, they're the ones getting those special ops teams where they need to be, often in extremely challenging conditions. I'm guessing they work closely with the 160th SOR. Absolutely. They often operate hand in hand, ensuring seamless coordination and maximum effectiveness in those time sensitive situations. Makes sense. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the 75th Ranger Regiment, the Rangers. Yes. Known for their direct action capabilities. If you need a high-value target taken out or a critical piece of infrastructure secured, the Rangers are the ones you're calling. Something tense. They are masters of direct action, trained to execute lightning-fast raids and assaults with surgical precision. They're the real deal. But ADP-305 also points out that they're not just a one-trick pony. Oh. They can also operate as conventional light infantry when needed, which speaks to their versatility and adaptability. So they're the total package. That's a good way to put it. Elite direct action force and adaptable light infantry. Yeah. It's no wonder they have such a reputation. 
it's incredible, really, how much goes into making sure these forces are ready for anything. Yeah. We've got the training, the equipment, the logistical support, and then this, you know, intricate command structure to make sure everyone is working together seamlessly. It really underscores, I think, the commitment to excellence within Army Special Operations. Yeah. And these command and control structures, as detailed in ADP 305, they aren't static, you know? They've right. evolved over, well, decades of experience, constantly adapting to, you know, the changing face of warfare. Which, you know, that makes me think back to something you said earlier about the ambassador's role. Right. It's not just about knowing the, you know, the military side of things. Right. It's about understanding the bigger picture. Yeah. The political landscape, the cultural nuances. Precisely. And that's something I hope our listener takes away from this deep dive. Yeah. You know, understanding ADP 305, it isn't just about memorizing acronyms and organizational charts. Right. It's about developing that broader awareness of how special operations fit into the larger strategic context. So it's as much about being a strategic thinker as it is about being a you know, tactical expert. Exactly. And that's more important than ever in today's world. The battlefields are evolving, yeah. becoming more complex, more fluid. The old ways of thinking, you know, the rigid command structures of the past, they simply aren't enough anymore. So what's the key to staying ahead of the curve? Hmm. What does ADP 305 emphasize in terms of preparing for these, you know, future challenges? Two words, adaptability and innovation. The doctrine provides a solid framework but it's up to the individual soldier, the individual leader, to think critically, to adapt to new information, to find creative solutions to unexpected problems. So it's not enough to just know the rules. You have to be able to rewrite them on the fly when the situation demands it. Exactly. And that takes a deep understanding, not just of tactics and procedures, but of the strategic environment, the cultural landscape, the human element. It's a lot to process, but absolutely essential for anyone involved in special operations. It is. And as we wrap up this deep dive into ADP 305, Chapter 3, I hope our listener walks away with a renewed appreciation for the complexity and importance of these command and control structures. And for our listener, a member of the U.S. Army, remember ADP 305 isn't just another, you know, dry document. It's a living, breathing guide to navigating the challenges of modern special operations. A roadmap to success in an increasingly complex and unpredictable world. Well said. And with that, this has been The Deep Dive. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep pushing the boundaries of your own knowledge.